Bill Murray eventually had to move because he was like, I'm sick of getting these scripts, I have to move house. And I'm not telling that f***ing Dan Aykroyd prick where I live. I don't really know. Dan Aykroyd, he, he's, he makes good movies though, right? I'm just joking. He's probably a legend. Is he still alive? Is Dan Aykroyd still alive? This video is brought to you by Magellan TV. You can discover a new type of documentary film experience with Magellan TV and its binge-worthy documentaries. Updated every week, and guess what? You're gonna hear more about them in a bit. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are! And now today's video. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I am Blaze Boy, Fact Boy, also known as Simon Dickhead. Uh, all of these sorts of things. This is cancel movies that we all missed out on. Everyone's gonna be like, Simon, you haven't seen any movies anyway. Ah, you haven't even seen The Godfather. You haven't even seen Lord of the Rings? And I'm like, <clears throat> I saw the first Lord of the Rings and it was a bit shit. How dare you? And I don't really like gangster movies. Other than Usual Suspects. Usual Suspects was really enjoyable. But then I saw everyone was like, gotta see Goodfellas. You gotta watch their Goodfellas. And I watched Goodfellas and I was like, I don't know, I'm just not into this. It's funny, you know, you're, you're, it's a good story. It's funny, you're a funny guy. <laughs> and then there was that other one, American something or other, with a, uh, was it with Denzel Washington? And I was like, oh fuck. Cares. I just don't care. I'm not into it. Why are we talking about this? Ah, because it's the subject of today's video. What's that on topic? Yes! Danny has written me a script. I'm gonna read it. And Sam, a wonderful video editor slash memeologist, is going to sprinkle in some of the finest of vintage memes. Yes! Here's a quick tip for any budding movie producers who harbor a burning desire for their new film to live on in the imagination of viewers for years and years. Don't actually bother finishing or releasing it. Yeah, it's like the North Korea version. Like I made a video, a business blaze, uh, what was then business blaze, now brain blaze, about uh, North Korea. And I was just like, oh my God, it got so off the rails. It got so crazy that I'm like, dude, I'm gonna get like that Novichok assassination if I put this out because it was just, it was just, it was just crazy. And uh, still, that seems to be the most talked about video, even though it doesn't exist. So that was a fucking lie. This is the trap that so many short-sighted Hollywood producers fall into time and time again. Admittedly, you probably wouldn't make much money by doing it my way. Yeah, I never made any money on that North Korea video. But the marvelous thing about a film that never happened is that it achieves mythical status and inspires feelings of deep wonder and aching melancholy over the perceived tragic loss of what would surely could have been a cinematic masterpiece. Mm. That North Korea cut. Cinematic masterpiece. <laughs> oh, good times. Yeah. The moment you actually release a completed film out into the wild, you get assassinate. Not, but no, you don't. But I could. Uh, you give it the capacity to disappoint. The film is now stripped of its mythical status and it becomes just another movie ready to be ripped to shreds. Unless it gets 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. And those movies do exist. This is a particularly common problem for long rumored sequels to popular films that have already acquired a devoted audience. Fans of 80s classics such as Tron, never seen it, Blade Runner, have seen that one, and perhaps to a lesser extent Space Jam. I have seen Space Jam when I was a kid, but I remember absolutely nothing about it. They spent decades demanding sequels while boiling over into spasms of excitement whenever revival rumors were regularly regurgitated. Am I imagining it, or did Space Jam recently get a follow-up? Space Jam was being talked about recently for some reason. I don't know why, because I don't care. But when the long-awaited sequels finally landed, oh wait, they made sequel to Space Jam. Obviously, ah, oh, it's right there in the script, isn't it, Fact Boy? I know you have abilities. I just don't know what they are. Ah, uh, the frenzied excitement was swiftly punctured in most cases. I quite liked that Blade Runner 2049 or whatever it was called. That was nice. The follow-ups to Tron and Blade Runner, I didn't see the Tron, I haven't seen anything to do with Tron, uh, aren't bad films, but it's hard to believe that they could ever be fully considered worth the wait of 28 years for Tron Legacy or 35 years for Blade Runner 2049. Was it really 35 years? Good lord. Meanwhile, the 15-year wait for Space Jam and New Legacy, released in 2021, there we go, has ended in crushing disappointment with a film driven largely by excessive product placement. Oh, didn't we learn our lesson from that movie, the fake E.T. movie, with the kid in the wheelchair? <laughs> And the McDonald's dance in the middle for no reason. Like, what the f <laughs> In the test audience, just, just be like, did any brand stick out to you? And if someone screams McDonald's, you know you've done it wrong. If they're like, yeah, I feel like there was McDonald's in there, that's okay. If they're shouting about the product placement, maybe just, I don't know, reconsider that shit. It's not just sequels that inspire such passion, though. Acclaimed directors such as Stanley Kubrick, Alfred Hitchcock, Francis Ford Coppola, and Terry Gilliam have also. Gilliam? Gilliam? 
Uh, I know the first three. I don't know who Terry Gilliam is. I've spent time in development hell working hard on movies that never made it to the screen. We often like to cling on to the idea that all these films were lost masterpieces. If they were, if they were true masterpieces, though, they'd have been made or released or something. Right? Show Dick some respect. They continue to generate intrigue within the boundaries of our imagination and expectations, but some of these films would probably have been dismissed as garbage if the directors had ever let them loose from our imaginations and slapped them on the cinema screen for judgment. Yeah, this is the problem. Like, if you're, you've got to manage your expectations. Like, I'm always trying to manage my expectations because otherwise, if you expect everything to be awesome all the time, then you're just going to be disappointed all the time. So I'm always like, let's just assume. And I don't want to come across as a pessimist because I generally think I'm quite an optimistic person. But it's like, if you just assume that, you know, everything's a bit shit, people are mostly incompetent, things are going to go wrong, that when they don't, you're like, eh, look at this, look at this, it's good, my house didn't burn down, woo! You have a poison in your mind and the fact that you can't see it makes me so sad. Bearing that in mind, I thought we'd try something a bit different on Brain Blaze by concluding this in with this introduction so that the unfinished video stands a better chance of getting hailed as the channel's glorious missing masterpiece rooted in myth and legend and genius. No, Danny, we've got the North Korea cut for that. And I can see there's another nine pages left. We're gonna be here forever. My legs are tired. However, that might leave Simon a bit of a loose end. That'd be okay. I'll just go crack another can of Coke and uh, do some other work that I need to do because it's a very busy day for me. So at the risk of ruining the whole damn thing, let's run through some of the more interesting examples of blockbuster movies that never actually got moving. Wait, Dune? I feel like I've heard of Dune. That is a movie, isn't it? I thought it was. If I was asked to pick out the worst film I've ever seen, it would probably be a toss-up between the 1964 oddity Santa Claus Conquers the Martians and David Lynch's 1984 adaptation of Dune. No. 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 I'm so depressed, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, the worst movie I've ever seen is uh, that f***ing piece of, Well, one, I, it's already got to be a musical for me. It's always got to be a musical because it's, I hate musicals. But what's that f***ing campy piece of sh um, with the Time Warp song? That is such a... I can't believe how shit that is. I can't believe I saw that. I'm fairly sure I didn't make it all the way through, but it is a piece of trash garbage and I don't understand how people could possibly like it. And I'm glad I don't remember its name. You have a poison in your mind. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Weirdly, I've seen Dune four times and hated every viewing. The first time I saw it, I was a kid. I watched it a second time when I was older because I thought I might have been too young to appreciate it the first time round. Sometimes, Danny, you just know you're right. Like I saw Lord of the Rings, the first one, when I was about 12 years old in the cinema, and I was like, well, I'm done with this forever. And then I, I, I tried watching it again when I must have been like 18 or 19 because a friend of mine was super into it. And I was just like, uh-uh, this isn't for me. This just is business and this was the extended version and i'm like dude <laughs> uh... do i need to call you a wambulance I watched a third time when I was going through a David Lynch marathon and then endured it a fourth time when it was shown on TV at a friend's house. i probably watch it another four times before I fully make up my mind. I'm usually a big admirer of David Lynch's work, but Dune is just a cold, sprawling, boring mess inhabited by lifeless performances and would be totally impenetrable to anyone uh, not vaguely familiar with the original books. So depressed. Maybe I haven't seen Dune. I'm not thinking of Dune. I'm thinking of a movie called Firefly, and I have no idea why I'm getting them confused. Maybe because they're Firefly's in a desert, right? And dunes are in the desert? Okay, I've got no idea what dune is. Never mind. Firefly's quite a good movie, though. I think I enjoyed that. It's often been said that Frank Herbert's series of sci-fi novels was unfilmable. The complex narrative swings across various noble houses in the distant future, all fighting for supremacy and control of the spice drug, which extends life and enhances mental abilities. Oh my god. Spice was a drug. This is like one of those artificial, uh, it's not cannabis, not like artificial cannabis. It's got a different name. And it was it like people up. Like it was like, how is this legal? It's definitely worse than weed. And it's like, just don't do that. A friend of mine 
had the had, had, was like on this and he was like dude it's intense like it was, he was like super addicted to it and he's like yeah you can just buy it in the shop and i'm like oh no, don't do that. But things would have turned out very differently if the original plans for the film had come to fruition in the mid-1970s. This version of Dune was to be directed by Chilean French filmmaker Alejandro Jodorowsky, a guy whose work I'm not familiar with. But uh, it's Jodorowsky, maybe. I'm sorry. But I gather that Alejandro has already drawn cult claim from for the two films, El Topo and The Holy Mountain, which were apparently a mixture of surreal satirical farce and psychedelic imagery peppered with liberal nudity. He was that kind of director. I don't know what that kind of director is. I mean, it sounds a bit, it sounds a bit shit. It sounds one of these ones where, I don't know. Like, I find art's fine, but like, some is just, it's just, I don't know, either I'm just not intellectually developed enough, which I'm absolutely considering as a possibility, or it's just a bit shit. And couldn't you, like, couldn't you have made something good? Like Jackson Pollock, obviously shit, in my opinion. <laughs> it's like Jackson Pollock's work is obviously nonsense. But people are like, oh my God, it's a hundred million dollars. It's about, well, obviously the price of it's bullshit because isn't art just like, it's that's all fake bullshit for like laundering money or some shit. But it's obviously nonsense. So, and I feel there's also movies like this. So they could just f off, in my opinion. <laughs> Especially you, Jackson Pollock, you knob. And now, commercials. This video is brought to you by Magellan TV. Yes, they're back. They're sponsoring another video because, well, it's just the perfect fit for this channel. It's like, look, you're here listening to Facts Boy, learning about stuff. I mean, Honestly, that copy works better on my other channels, where you really are here to learn about stuff. On this one, it's like, oh, this video is a bit of a mess, isn't it? Always is, but Magellan, you know, still, people, obviously, you guys like Magellan. Because they keep coming back and they're like, fat boy, we need more adverts from you because <laughs> you're legends. They come over to Magellan. And I'm like, well, thank you, Magellan. And thank you, legends. It's the glorious circle of capitalism, as we've talked about many times. Far superior to that circle of life bullshit. I'm going to use all my money to get cryogenically frozen. Yes, f*** the circle of life. Daddy, chill. With Magellan, you can find one of the broadest catalogues of history content available pretty much anywhere today with more than 3,000 documentaries available for streaming and more added every week. That is a lot. So when you watch all 3,000, you'll be like, oh my god, I'm glad there's more. Because <laughs> I saw all 3,000 of them. And now I'm bored. So depressed. What am I going to do? Watch another streaming service like an idiot? Like a tiny brain? Because Magellan, as we've discussed before, is for big brains. So if you're looking for 4K explorations of binge-worthy topics. Yeah, that's the thing, I mean, with any of these things. I mean, honestly, it's not just Magellan, is it? But you log into one of these things, you know, streaming platforms like Magellan. In fact, let's just talk about Magellan, because that's what this ad is for. And you're just like, oh my god, yeah, I'll watch the next episode. Yeah, I'll watch the next episode. And you get to the end of the season, and they've got, like, those recommendations on screen for the next thing to watch. You're like, yeah, okay, I'm into that. Today I'm recommending Battlefields of the World Wars. I am. Uh, am I? Okay, brilliant. Yeah, it's a good one. You guys probably enjoy that. It's about war. I love all the war ones. <laughs> like modern warfare, I've talked about this before, like 21st century, it's my shit. Like, I love that. Not 21st, 20th century. All of that stuff, very interesting. So look, if you wanna make an amazing addition to your streaming lineup, just click the link in the description below and let Magellan hook you up. It's documentary content for days and days. You'll be happy you did, and back to today's video. Thank you, Magellan. Alejandro planned to make the most ambitious science fiction film to date and already secured an impressive budget of just under $10 million to bring his artistic interpretation of Dune to the silver screen. And he has certainly managed to attract some truly stellar talent to his planned production. He got the acclaimed comic artist Jean, Jean Mobius Girard to come up with the storyboard of 3,000 images, while the main design of the film would have been handled by H.R. Geiger, the Swiss artist who would later be responsible for creating the iconic visuals of the 1979 classic Alien. Seen that pretty good. And who had a propensity for making everything he designs look a bit like a vagina. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Some of the soundtrack would have been provided by the French prog I mean, at least it looked like something. <laughs> Jackson Pollock, mate. <laughs> it looks like vomit. It looks like you vomited through a sieve onto a piece of paper after eating a bunch of nail polish of different colors. Some of the soundtrack would have been provided by French progressive rock band Magma, but the bulk of the material would have been composed by none other than Pink Floyd. Oh. Uh, eh, eh, Pink Floyd, nah. Not bad, not good. 
Uh, who were pretty much the coolest band on earth at the time following the release of Dark Side of the Moon. Orson Welles eventually signed on to appear in the film, but only on the strict condition that Alejandro hired his favorite gourmet chef to prepare meals for the actor while on set. Oh my god. Slightly weirdly, the role of Emperor Shaddam IV was given to the surrealist artist Salvador Dali. Holy sh a man with no acting experience whatsoever and who refused to look at the script because, as he explained to Alejandro, my ideas are better than yours. <laughs> oh my god. Salvador Dali. I mean, I like, if you want to talk about talent at the opposite end, like, I love Salvador Dali. I think it's the, the, the talent that that artist had is unbelievable. The fact that Jackson Pollock and Salvador Dali could be mentioned in the same sentence, like, someone said, name famous artist, Dali. Uh, why can't I think of any famous artists? B <laughs> Pollock. Why am I thinking of Mozart? He's not an artist. Ah, why am I so stupid? Who knows? <laughs> but I mean, it's Salvador Dali. That is like, I mean, you don't make movies though, do you? Despite his lack of experience, Salvador Dali also expressed a desire to become the highest paid actor in the history of Hollywood and demanded a salary of $100,000 a minute. Alandra accepted his demands. I assume that's per minute of screen time rather than uh, per minute on set, because that's going to get really expensive real fast. Alandra accepted his demands, but then worked out a cunning ruse so that Salvador Dali would only actually be needed on set for about five minutes at the most, while the rest of his lines would be provided by a robot lookalike. Okay. One actor who turned down the opportunity to participate was Charlotte Rampling. Never heard of her. Although she auditioned for the film and was offered the role, she had a change of heart when she realized that one of the scenes involved her working with 2,000 extras who were all expected to defecate on cue. Oh my god, what is this movie up to? <laughs> defecating on cue. <laughs> defecating reminds me of a Jackson Pollock painting. Is art! The all-star cast would be joined by Alandro's own 12-year-old son who underwent two years of intensive martial arts training to prepare for the leading role of Paul at Trides. What a waste of time it turned out to be for the poor kid. Yeah, on the other hand, he got two free years of martial arts training. Not bad. And he probably got paid for it. Alejandro had already blown two million dollars of his budget on just pre-production, and he now realized that he needed at least another five million dollars to get this movie off the ground. But sadly for him, nobody was willing to stump up the money. It's probably because it sounds a bit sh isn't it, Alejandro? That's probably why. This could have been because the script was the size of a phone book, and Alejandro had insisted that the running time of the movie would be somewhere around 10 to 14 hours. And you thought Lord of the Rings dragged on a bit. Honestly, though, I'd probably rather, if someone was like, do you want to watch this Alejandro sh movie? Or do you want to watch the Lord of the Rings extended version, which is probably like 27 hours altogether, I'd be like, yeah, no, I think I'd rather watch 2,000 people defecate. Yeah, I guess I would. Enough, enough. The madness stops here. Alandre later lamented that the project was sabotaged because it simply wasn't quite Hollywood enough. That could be the reason, or perhaps the film studios just weren't quite gripped by a desire to throw another five million dollars at a 14 hour long movie which involved 2,000 shitting extras and a robot lookalike of Salvador Dali. Yes, it all sounds a bit shite. I'm very curious about the, the, the version of Dune that they remade, that the, the actual one that got made though. Is it, is it at all crazy like this? The cancellation of the project eventually led to David Lynch's version of the film, which Alejandro initially refused to see out of alleged jealousy. But when his son finally dragged him out to the cinema, probably made a nice change for his martial art from his martial arts lessons. Alejandro admitted that he was overwhelmed by happiness and joy when he saw the film was clearly a massive pile of sandworm poop. Oh, you're a bit of a dick, though. Can't you just be like, if it was bad, just be like, oh, yeah, it's bad. No one can make this movie. Rather than like, yes! <laughs> I just feel that that's a sh personality trait. So depressed. The three years of work that went into Alejandro's pre-production still arguably influenced the future of science fiction films. For starters, it was Alejandro who assembled the same team of designers, including H.R. Geiger, to work on the Alien film. But the concept of art and storyboards were also passed around Hollywood and are said to have inspired the design of such films as Star Wars, Flash Gordon, The Terminator, and The Fifth Element. The really good news is that Denis Villeneuve's brand new version of Dune has recently been landed in was recently landed in cinemas, really? Have I never heard of this? I guess I just don't go to the cinema anymore. And is said to be a vast improvement on the woeful David Lynch effort. Purists may be disappointed to find out that it only is, is two and a half hours long, though. If you're not going to bother to take the time to steal, steal, blah, blah, blah. If you're not going to bother to take the time to sell the story properly, what's the point? I don't know, because no one wants to sit in the cinema for 14 hours. They'd have to introduce breaks in the middle of movies like they did in the past, which I still think is a good idea. Like, I'm not old now. And I still need to pee in the middle of a movie because I've got myself like a big coke. You what? 
and I'm like, oh, I really need to pee. Okay, I'm just gonna have to miss like five minutes of this movie. Why can't we have an intermission? It was just five minutes in the middle of the movie. Why not? Ten minutes. I mean, it'd be nice, like find a good place for it. We can go get some more snacks, grab another beer, whatever. This would be perfect. I don't understand why that's not a thing anymore. In this case, the past was the best. The Fall of Napoleon. One of the remarkable things about the legendary director Stanley Kubrick is that he never got stuck in a groove. Each new film project that he took on was always a completely different kettle of turnips to the last one. And whenever he tried his hand at tackling a different genre, he often ended up directing a strong contender for the greatest ever film in that genre. That's pretty legendary when you're that good. It's like me and my YouTube channel. Ah, just making the best stuff in every genre. Yes! And so modest. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Never seen it. That's slightly embarrassing. I feel like I should see that one because I like science fiction. It's often regarded as the best science fiction movie of all time. <laughs> He's obviously never heard of Star Trek First Contact, has he? The Shining is often regarded as the best horror movie of all time. Doctor Strangelove is often regarded as the best black comedy of all time. And his final film, Eyes Wide Shut, is probably often regarded as the best film in whatever unfathomable genre it was meant to represent. I feel, I've seen Eyes Wide Shut. It's that Tom Cruise one, right? Nicole Kidman? Weird movie. Weird movie. But fans share a strong fascination with one particular Kubrick movie, and naturally, it's the movie that never got made. But in this case, you can't blame the fans for getting excited. In Kubrick's own words, Napoleon wasn't just meant to be the greatest period film of all time, he was proudly intending to direct the greatest film of all time, period. A Stanley Kubrick movie, period movie about Napoleon, would be f***ing cool. That would be cool. Following the phenomenal success of 2001 A Space Odyssey in 1968, Kubrick pretty much had free reign with MGM to direct whatever film he fancied making. And so he decided to press ahead with a truly epic movie chronicling the life of Napoleon Bonaparte, a character who had fascinated Kubrick since childhood and whom the director described as one of those rare men who move history and mold the destiny of their own times and generations to come. I mean, well put, Napoleon did change them me. <laughs> Napoleon was a bit of a badass. <laughs> The film would have followed Napoleon from his birth in Corsica in 1769 to his death in exile on the British held island of St. Helena in 1821. Along the way, Kubrick intended to cover his hero's fiercely passionate relationship with Josephine and ambitiously stage full scale recreations of Napoleon's most infamous battles. That would be sick. I'm not even a big one, like, um, you know, these historical epics like Gladiator and stuff. It's good. It's good. It's not just, it's just not my type of movie. Which is most types of movie, apparently, judging by what people say in the comments. But this sounds really cool. Nerd! No expense would be spared in this department. Kubrick casually declared at the time that he envisioned using around 50,000 extras to take on the roles of infantry and the cavalry. The queue for the burger van would have been, frankly, enormous. MGM happily stumped up the funds for Kubrick's research and development, and it's here that we see Kubrick's quite staggeringly obsessive attention to detail. He spent the best part of two years researching every single aspect of Napoleon's life and the period in which he lived in much the same way that I do for a typical brain blaze script. Danny a legend! Aside from reading hundreds of books and watching every single Napoleon film made up to that point, he sent his team around the world to research the tiniest details from the color of the soil on the battlefield to the exact shape of a nail in a horseshoe in order to get, in a bid to get the minds in a bid to get in the mindset of the title character, he even adopted Napoleon's real-life diets and habits. Super intense. Jack Nicholson was originally in line to play the lead, although other names bandied around, including the likes of Laurence Olivier, Alec Guinness, and Ian Holm. But sadly for Kubrick, he ultimately lost the battle to get his masterpiece on screen. During those two years of almost comically intensive research, MGM had changed hands and new owners seemed more interested in producing TV shows and building casinos. Oh yeah, the MGM Casino! In, in Las Vegas, right? I, had, I just didn't put that together with the people who make movies, and that's crazy. Then fly throwing vast amounts of money at a wildly ambitious historical epic. It didn't ma help matters that historical dramas appeared to have fallen from fashion following a string of box office bombs, including most notably the 1970 disaster Waterloo. Fifty years later, there's still a chance that we might see some of Kubrick's vision on the smaller screen as Steven Spielberg is apparently developing a new TV series based on Kubrick's original screenplay. I think that's really cool because nowadays, like, TVs are so big and so good and it's all 4K and they throw so much money at it that you're just like, this is as good as the cinema. Like, there are TV shows that are just legitimately as good as movies. 
you're like, wow. Because, I mean, you look at, like, the comparison in the past. I mentioned, like, Star Trek First Contact. You compare that to, like, Star Trek TV shows that were being made at the time, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> this looks amazing. And the TV shows look shit. But nowadays, it's like, you can't, can you tell the difference? Like, if someone played a movie and a TV show side by side, you'd be like, no, it looks good. Both looks great. <laughs> Apparently, everyone got loads more money from somewhere. Or I guess visual effects got cheaper and better, and uh, people shoot on the digital, so it's cheaper than film. But those two years of research weren't entirely wasted. Kubrick later drew upon some of the work to create his 1975 period drama Barry Lyndon, based on the 1844 novel by William Makepeace Thackeray. And he didn't make too bad of a job of it. Uh, Barry Lyndon is now often regarded as the best period drama of all time. I've never heard of Barry Lyndon. Weird. Fab Frodo and the Rockin' Hobbits. Oh no, that's, is this, it's not Lord of the Rings, is it? It's that other one. It's by that same guy. Fucking Tolkien. Ugh. Ugh. How dare you? A brief mention must go to one of Simon's very favorites, Lord of the Rings. No, Danny, no! Wow, <laughs> Uh, long before Peter Jackson's Blink and You'll Miss It trilogy, long before even Ralph Bakshi's beautiful animated film version from 1978, a gang of four ruffians from Liverpool were keen to make the world's first cinematic adaption of J.R.R. Tolkien's epic journey through Middle Earth. Are we going to talk about the Beatles? Did the Beatles want to make this? What the f***? And those four ruffians were the Beatles! Ha! <laughs> because, I mean... If, he's, if anyone says four people from Liverpool in the like entertainment industry, there's no other four people from Liverpool who are in the industry. It's the Beatles. That's the only answer. And it's like, yeah, I got there about making some sort of Lord of the Rings movie. It's always the Beatles. In 1963, the Fab Four signed a three movie deal with United Artists, but only the first two films, A Hard Day's Night and Help, ever made it into production. The third was meant to be an adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, which would apparently have seen Paul McCartney take on the role of Frodo, John Lennon as Gollum. <laughs> Ringo Starr as Seb and George Harrison as Gandalf. I'm vaguely familiar with what these people look like in these Lord of the Rings movies. And I'm vaguely familiar with what the Beatles look like. <laughs> All I imagine is a really old Ringo Starr, but I mean, obviously he was young back then, but it's really weird. <laughs> and if you think about it for a few moments, it's quite easy to see the Beatles inhabit those specific roles. McCartney had the hair and cheeky innocence of Frodo, George Harrison had the beard and enigmatic qualities of Gandalf, and Ringo had the confused voice and questionable intelligence of Sam. Well, if it's your grandfather, who knows? <laughs> Not sure about Lennon as Gollum, though. <laughs> Lennon can just off. We made a video, I don't know if it's come out yet, about, about like, famous dickheads. <laughs> John Lennon had a strong feature in there because he was a bell. Uh, perhaps if the film had been made a bit later on, Lennon could have taken on the slightly grumpy role of Treebeard and left the role of Gollum open for Yoko Ono. Why every video do we have to mention Yoko Ono? It just reminds me of her. And I don't like being reminded of her. Are you winning, son? <laughs> Although all four Beatles were apparently big Tolkien fans and would apparently would have collectively provided the soundtrack for the movie, it was Lennon who proved to be the driving force of the project. He was very keen to get Scan and he was very keen to get Stanley Kubrick on as director. However, Kubrick deemed The Lord of the Rings to be unfilmable as the story was too vast and dense, and so he turned down the offer. Oh no, what is it? Why? Why do I have a phone call? Why? A few moments later. That's a bit of a shame, as under Kubrick's hands, this musical version of Lord of the Rings could well have become regarded as the best fantasy movie featuring talking trees and goblins of all time. Yes, I bet it would have been brilliant. Lord of the Rings, already something I hate as a musical. Something I hate even more. Vaguely redeemed by the music of the Beatles. But even if Kubrick had signed up for a trip to Mount Doom, there would have been another impossible obstacle blocking this potential path of glory. It turns out that stuffy old J.R.R. Tolkien absolutely f***ing hated the Beatles and pop music in general and point blank refused to negotiate with them over the rights to his work, fearing that the film would be a load of psychedelic noise and nonsense with LSD dripping from every frame. <laughs> and because of this, we never got to see a mob top Frodo band in saving the realm of Middle Earth from the forces of evil with a little help from his friends. Tolkien sounds like a bit of a bell, doesn't he? <laughs> but it's art. Ghostbusters 3 Hellbent. Two of the original Ghostbusters class clearly had very different feelings over a movie franchise which appeared to have been snuffed out as early as 1979, 1989 following the relative disappointment of Ghostbusters 2. It was a movie franchise which would be pretty much dead for the next 27 years before spookily rising from the grave in 2016. 
Everyone hated it then, didn't they? And then, just like when you, just like we'd been waiting for ages for a bus, two came along in relatively quick succession. Co-writer and star Dan Aykroyd was keen to get a third movie in development from the 1990s, and in fact spent the best part of two decades writing scripts and pushing ahead with plans for a Ghostbusters 3 that never quite made it into the physical plane. But a bum bum Fellow Ghostbuster Bill Murray has never shown quite as much enthusiasm. In fact, he proved to be the biggest obstacle in Dan Aykroyd's path for at least 20 years and clearly couldn't give a shit about reprising his role as one of the funniest characters from the original movies, Peter Venkman. Yeah, Bill Murray, legend. Haven't seen Ghostbusters in ages. Should probably rewatch that. Just, I bet it's still good. To be fair to Bill, he hadn't really even wanted to appear in the original Ghostbusters film in 1980. Uh, in 1980. In 1984, Bill was attached to the project Razor's Ed The Razor's Edge, an unusually serious and gentle role for Bill, in which he plays a troubled former soldier who attempts to find inner peace by joining a Buddhist monastery in the Himalayas. I've not seen that. I'd like to see that. Bill was passionate about The Razor's Edge, but the producers were having difficulty in getting a studio to finance it. His pal, Dan Aykroyd, has suggested that Columbia Pictures... Blah, 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 what are you doing? might finance the film if Bill agreed to sign a deal to appear in Ghostbusters. And sure enough, a deal was struck. The Razor's Edge turned out to be a critical and commercial flop, whilst the film that Bill only worked on to help finance The Razor's Edge turned out to be the most successful blockbuster of the year. Bill also claims that he was more or less tricked into filming Ghostbusters 2 in 1989 as he turned up- Yeah, Bill, just like you got tricked into the Garfield thing, right? <laughs> Tricky one. I think like, okay, I'll let it fly once. It's like, yeah, you didn't know better. And then it's like, yeah, but twice. As he turned up on set to find the script was not the one he had signed up for, he later complained, they got us in the sequel under false pretenses. There's never been an interest for me in a third Ghostbusters because the second one was disappointing. That didn't stop Dan Aykroyd from trying to persuade his old buddy to change his mind over the course of the next 20 odd years. That I'll be like, Dan! Leave it alone. Every time we go out, Dan, you're always banging on about doing Ghostbusters 3. F off, Dan. It's getting old. Uh. What the fuck is it with you? He's hanging, I thought I was getting pitched on me. He's hanging on my fucking neck like a vulture. Uh, like an ending day. What do you want? Dan's original script for the proposed Ghostbusters 3, Hellbent, was always intended to star the original team of Aykroyd, Murray, Harold Ramis, Ernie Hudson, and Rick Moranis. But it would also be passing on the bat into a fresh, younger, and apparently more good-looking team of Ghostbusters. Even as early as the 1990s, it seems that everyone agreed the original team were getting a bit too old in the tooth and to be bearing the heavy burden of a proton pack. The script, often referred to as Ghostbusters Go to Hell, sounded quite interesting. The setting is an increasingly overcrowded version of Hell, which is kind of a dark mirror version of Manhattan and goes under the name Manhelton. The place is getting so full that the cursed souls are getting evicted by the devil and sent back up to the land of the living for the Ghostbusters to deal with. All the main characters also have a twin from Da Manhelton, which would have allowed the likes of Dan and Bill to get their teeth into playing dual roles as both goodies and baddies. It's not a bad concept, but Bill was not having any of it. He complained that the scripts were too crazy to comprehend and later revealed that he would only return to the franchise if his character of Peter Venkman was killed off in the very first reel. I'll do it, I'll do it, but kill me off so you don't have to, like, Dan, fuck's sake, if you, just kill me off. Then we could go and have dinner and you're not gonna bang on about Ghostbusters 17, are you, Dan? Because I'm dead. And they'll be like, Bill, you know the movie's called Ghostbusters, right? You're now a ghost, Bill. That's what we did, you're a ghost. So you're the star, the extra starry star of all the next Ghostbusters. And Bill's just like, fuck. Funnily enough, one of the later versions of the scripts did just that. But rather ambitiously, hopes that Peter Venkman would still appear in the rest of the film as a kind of ghostly mentor to the main team. Oh, oh. Sometimes my big brain knows no bounds. Where are you, Hollywood? It's time for me to come and write some scripts for you, isn't it? No. Although Bill's presence would have clearly helped get a third movie off the ground, the rest of the team would clearly have been better off just forgetting about Peter Venkman and proceeding without Bill instead of regularly sending him new scripts over 20 years. But there were other problems too. Rick Moranis is like, <laughs> Bill Murray eventually had to move because he was like, I'm sick of getting these scripts, I have to move house. And I'm not telling that f***ing Dan Aykroyd prick where I live. I don't really know. Dan Aykroyd, he, he's, he makes good movies though, right? I'm just joking. He's probably a legend. Is he still alive? Is Dan Aykroyd still alive? One of these guys recently died, right? Was it Harold Ramis? Maybe it was Harold, I don't know, who cares? Rick Moranis wouldn't have been interested in taking part either as he'd retired from acting in 1997 to bring up his children following the death of his wife. Legend. Rick Moranis' story is, like, very cool. Great job. 
And the, man, and the main stumbling block was a lack of interest from Columbia Pictures in financing the third film. Following the lackluster response to Ghostbusters 2, they felt the huge, that the huge cost of producing a third entry just wouldn't be economically viable. But Dan Aykroyd never gave up. He was still working on proposals for new versions of Ghostbusters 3 throughout the early 2010s, along with other writers and the original director, Ivan Reitman. It sounds as if we got tantalizingly close in 2014, but following the death of original co-star and writer Harold Ramis, there we go, in 2000, oh, it was a long time ago though. I thought it was recent. Did someone else die recently from Ghostbusters? Ivan Reitman lost faith in the project. He later decided that a potential revival was being held back by the fact that the creative control and rights to the Ghostbusters franchise were shared between himself, Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, and the estate of Harold Ramis. Really? That's interesting. So they like they own that sh That's cool. And most of those rights holders agreed to sell up, except, of course, for that awkward bugger Bill Murray. He still seemed very keen to keep hold of his cut from any potential sequels, which he had zero interest in working upon himself. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it sounds like a pretty smart move there, doesn't it, for old Bill? However, over the course of two weeks, Ivan Ryman constantly badgered Bill to sell his stake, and a lucrative deal was eventually struck with Columbia. Although details of the deal were never revealed, Ivan claims the creators will be enriched for the rest of our lives and the rest of our children's lives. Holy sh**. It's like, yeah, no, that deal made me rich. No, no, it didn't just make me rich. It made me and my children's children's children rich. That's when you know it's a lot of money. This paved the way for Columbia's to, with Columbia to press ahead with the female-led Ghostbusters reboot in 2016, directed and co-written by Paul Feig, which was very different to anything Dan Aykroyd had envisaged, quite unfairly. This often entertaining film attracted hostile online backlash before a single frame of it had even been viewed. Oh, okay, maybe I, 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 I have not seen it. I just know people were complaining about it for some reason. I don't even remember why. Was it because it just had women? That doesn't seem like a very good reason. But, uh, I don't know. Well, maybe I'll see it someday. But you didn't! It proved to be a commercial flop. It appears to have been brushed under the carpet with the admitment of arrival of Ghostbusters Afterlife in 2021. Directed by Jason Reitman, son of Ivan, who serves as a producer, this fourth entry in the franchise completely ignores the 2016 reboot and carries on directly from Ghostbusters 2, featuring both a new team and strong supporting roles from the original cast. Bill Murray's a funny fellow, though. Despite his apparent... Uh, please tell me he's in this movie. I love it. Despite his apparent refusal to return to Ghostbusters, he actually popped up again several times. He's actually he actually popped up again several times over the years. The Ghostbusters video game from 2009 features the voices of all of the original team except Rick Moranis and is often considered by fans to be the real Ghostbusters 3, except it's a video game. Bill made a rather crappy cameo in the 2016 reboot and has returned to the role of Peter Venkman in the new Afterlife movie without being killed off in the first reel. And we may not have seen the last of Ghostbusters as the fiercely persistent Dan Aykroyd has now written a proposed new prequel called Ghostbusters High, which could potentially be either a film or a TV series. Let's hope he's still got Bill Murray's telephone number. Who else are you gonna call? Yes! This has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to purchase the merch, yes, purchase the merch.co. And I'll see you next time. And I still need to pee in the middle of a movie because I've got myself like a big Coke. You what?